So, <clears throat> it's very nice to, to have so many people here gathered uh, to hear about and discuss this very interesting, very important topic. Uh, we have called it the politics of results and transformational development, what needs to change. I'm Jörn Sundström and I will be moderating this event. Uh, the aim of this seminar is to increase our knowledge of experiences with developing and implementing results and evidence programs in different development aid uh, contexts. Uh, we hope that the seminar will inspire development professionals and organizations um, to find ways forward which enable and generate new and better model, uh, methods as well as better use of existing <coughs> methods for results and evidence. Uh, the seminar is hosted by Stockholm Center for Organizational Research, SCORE, uh, which is a research institute based at both Stockholm University and Stockholm School of Economics, where we are today. And at SCORE I am leading uh, an ongoing research project about the efforts made by the four Swedish uh, central-right government uh, to implement what was uh, called, and is still called, I think, uh, the Results Agenda, which uh, was an, an attempt to develop and make use of various methods that can demonstrate the effectiveness of different efforts made by different actors using public development aid uh, to improve the, the lives of those living in, in poverty. This introduction of the new kind of results uh, agenda that the, the former government then started out has not been unique for Sweden. Uh, on the contrary, many donating countries around the world have launched, uh, launched similar results and evidence programs in recent years. Uh, in recent years, which is clearly demonstrated and discussed in this excellent new book uh, called The Politics of Evidence and Results in, in International Development, Playing the Games to Change the Rules. And we are very happy to have some of the authors of this book here today among us. Uh, and we will start this seminar um, <clears throat> um, by letting the authors present the book, some of the authors, uh, as you can see here. Um, uh, we have first Professor Rosalind Avon sitting here in the front, who is an anthropologist from the Institute of Development Studies, uh, which is based at the University of Sussex. And Rosalind is one of the uh, editors, and she will tell us about the int introducing uh, parts of the book and also some of the conclusions, or perhaps I should say some of the suggestions made uh, in the end of the book. We have also Kathy Shoot, Shoot, okay, Shoot. <laughs> who is an academic with uh, over 20 years' experience within the international development sector as a researcher teacher, as well as a uh, consultant. Uh, Kathy is also an editor of the book, and she will tell us about the ch her chapter, which is called The Politics and Practice of Value for Money. And finally, we have Janet Wehmecki, uh, who is a PhD student at Stockholm Business School, of, of Stockholm, at Stockholm University. And she is writing a dissertation within the research project at SCORE, which I mentioned, uh, about the Swedish government's results agenda. And Janice has also background with 13 years within <coughs> with SIDA, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, civil society organizations, and consultancies within development aid. You are, all three of you, very welcome to this seminar. And we are very pleased to have you here. After the book has been presented, we will have uh, some room for questions, and then we have a coffee break around 
quarter past two. And then we move back here, quarter to three, and start the other part of the seminar, which is uh, have the form of a, a, a panel with four guests representing four different kinds of professions and perspectives, one could say. We have a politician, uh, we have a valuation specialist, a journalist, and a consultant. Uh, I will introduce them later, <coughs> closer, after the coffee break. So, <clears throat> we will start with the book presentation. Uh, the authors will speak for 30, 40 minutes, or something like that, and then we'll have some questions. So, welcome, Rosalind. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, is it on? Is it on? It is. It is. Can you hear me? I just wanted to say how lovely it is to be back in Stockholm on such a lovely sunny day. I hope the sun shines for you throughout the winter. <laughs> <laughs> um, it also reminds me, I've come in and out of Stockholm a lot over the last 25 years, and it's good to see some old friends here. But I particularly remember, I think it was in May or June 2011, uh, when the Nordic Africa Institute and Gerwin and Holmquist organized a meeting, something like this, on the challenges of the results agenda in, in international development was down somewhere in Gambia, I think. Uh, and I remember there was a lot of enthusiasm and discussion about it. Uh, and I was at that meeting in, with respect to the, the early stages of what I sometimes call was a kind of a, a little international social movement in the development sector, which was called the Big Push Forward. The book that we're launching today, and by the way, you've seen there's also some postcards about it. Um, we put them on the front seats to encourage people to come and sit at the front. <laughs> um, uh, so this is the book, um, and the book is the outcome of the Big Push Forward. So what I'm going to do is um, introduce the book to you. Uh, and hopefully that will excite you to go away and order it <coughs> in your library or buy it. Um, and in that context, I'd really like to thank Stockholm University and Janet, whose name, surname I could never pronounce properly, uh, Is that okay? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, because Janet contacted, contacted me, I think in about 2012, about then, saying that she was doing this research on results in CEDA and she'd like to interview me and things. And then she became an active participant in the Big Push Board and has written a brilliant chapter in our book, which she's going to tell you about shortly. So, what is a book? The origins of the book, um, I'm going to talk about briefly. Then the key themes, and then strategies for change. And why we call it we call it strategies for change because the book is political. I don't mean party political, but I mean it's about recognizing that the results agenda is all about power. Um, power about how and who decides what is a result and what is evidence. And how power creates compliance, but also resistance and contestation. So it's about the, po the politics of it. We're not going to talk in this book about methods as such, but more about the bureaucratic protocols and the political impact of such protocols and the, the power impact on development organisations. And discuss and the book discusses why and how why and how it is political. Okay, occasionally in the last two or three years, um, I've been, people have come up to me and said, but you're not against results, are you? Surely you can't be against evidence, you're an academic. No, but academics have to have evidence. And so just to you know, clear things up, a big push forward movement, as we called ourselves, that was challenging 
what we saw as some of the stupidities of the results agenda. Of course, we're, we were not against results or evidence. We were against a certain framing of result and a certain framing of evidence in which other people's perspectives and understanding of what is a result and what is evidence were excluded. Um, so let's just clear that. Um, this, that, this funny little cartoon uh, of the results beast um, comes from a workshop that uh, Chris Roche, who's one of the other editors of the book, and Irene Hoyt, the fourth editor of the book, we did a, a workshop for the Australian Development Agency at that time called AusAid uh, in Canberra. Uh, and it was a large staff participation. And one of the staff members drew this picture on the back of a card and gave it to me. So because she's a, a staff member, a government, a government employee, I'm afraid I can't say whose name it was, but I think it's a brilliant uh, little cartoon. The results piece, feed me, feed me, feed me. Uh, and our argument was that this demand of the beast to be fed was actually changing the way that we were going about doing development. Now, as Huan has already said, um, this was just this we found was happening in a large number of different international development organisations, and of course, it's not just with reference to the development sector. Um, it's an aspect of new public management which plays itself out in domestic policy, in health, education, so on and so forth. It's always been our argument that it becomes more pathological in the development sector than in domestic policy sectors. For the reason that in domestic policy, the citizens of Sweden or the United Kingdom uh, can actually say, hang on, wait a minute, it's not really like that. What are you doing? There's some kind of democratic process and feedback loop from citizens to government. But in the development sector, the citizens that development organisations are aiming to support are somewhere else in the world. And so there's no reality check. And so the, if you like, the virus of the results agenda gets exaggerated because there's no way, very difficult, for people to actually push back against it. Uh, because the results are being achieved for the parliaments and governments of the donor countries, not actually, uh, in reality, for the people in developing countries that aid is meant to be helping. Yes, that's what the rhetoric says, but the, the, the drive and demand for results is coming from parliament and government, is results for the domestic taxpayers. Whereas in the domestic sectors, the taxpayers and the citizens benefiting from the services are one and the same people. In the development <coughs> sector, they're not. So it's a particular problem. Uh, so we called it the big push forward. And what we were aiming to do was to create the political space for discussing and debating this. Uh, and we, gave us, we ourselves took a political position. We said it's all about politics. It's Im impossible to be objective. So we want to be transparent about the political position in which we take. Uh, and we saw ourselves as a group of people committed to what we were calling transformative or transformational development, where the how, how you go about supporting development processes is as important as the what. And the investment in the relationships uh, within the system that help bring about change is as important as what happens as an outcome. Because if you don't focus on the how, then the outcomes in any case are not sustainable. So we were worried that the results agenda was not looking at the processes of change, 
and ha the complexity of such processes. And we're finishing up by international aid agencies designing projects that could be easily counted and measured and not designing projects that were complex, messy, unpredictable what were going to be the outcomes. So, after two years of working together um, to, we had a big, we had a website, we went around the world having workshops and talking to people. It took up a lot of energy and it was all voluntary. So we thought we can't go on forever. It's much better to put a lot of energy into it and then stop. Uh, and in the hope and expectation, the ripples of the activities would continue on. So we finished with a conference called The Politics of Evidence. And there's one or two people in the room, including Anna, who's going to speak later. Anna, where are you? Uh, we're at the conference, right? And from the conference, uh, we then produced, we invited conference participants if they'd like to contribute to a book. Um, many came in fascinating case studies, but some of the participants were quite reluctant to publish anything to put their name to it. Even in the process of producing the book, we saw the, the power at work. Um, people who didn't want to get published. They were prepared to talk in a, in a safe space, but not to go public about some of the effects of the results agenda. But others did, uh, and we're enormously grateful for those who did contribute to the book. Um, so we have a diversity of chapters. Uh, unfortunately, most are from northern development professionals. Uh, and the reason for that is that the people who were coming to the conference were largely people from the north. And that was because they had to pay their own way because we didn't, we had very little financial support. Because if you like, we were pushing against the conventional, the mainstream political, uh, you won't be surprised to hear that we've got very little funding. However, in the context of this room, I should like to say that we did get some funding from CEDA. Is anyone here from CEDA at the moment? Well, there we are. Thank you very much, CEDA. Uh, we did get some funding from you, sir. Unfortunately, um, nobody from CEDA actually came to the conference, which was a pity. <laughs> and we also got some funding from InDevelop. Thank you very much, InDevelop. So we picked up little bits of money from a range of organisations. It was enough to, you know, to get the conference going, but it wasn't enough to pay airfares and subsistence of people from a long way away in other parts of the world. And we feel very bad about this. So this book is not comprehensive. It's a certain perspective. There's just one contribution uh, from uh, a student of mine who was already in the UK. It was a Palestinian woman. Uh, an active civil society leader in development uh, disabled people's organisations in the Middle East. And she has written a most brilliant chapter about what happened when her organisation got money for the first time from a, a United Nations agency. And at the conference itself, she said, it, it was no longer our project. They took over our project. Their idea had been taken away. So I recommend that chapter. When we looked at the various contributions that we had got from the authors, we identified two sets of, um, three sets of themes really. We looked at how the politics of results play, plays out, different pressures and responses to the results agenda, depending on your positionality. We found that monitoring and evaluation specialists were really benefiting from it. And indeed, many organisations were actually doing monitoring and evaluation better as a result of this pressure. So it's not all bad news. We started off critical, but we found some interesting feedback that people were able to support uh, rights-based, transformative political processes of social change using the results and evidence agenda. 
if they were politically savvy, if they were politically skillful. Um, we found, however, a, a particular section of people who, in my chapter, I referred to as a squeezed middle, which was like the program officers in many large international development agencies who actually have pressure to deliver the results agenda from above and are trying to not impose too much on the people in the country programs or the civil society organizations that are being funded. And so they get squeezed, they try and prevent passing the damage down the line, um, but quite often they do so. Um, we, it's the, book, the book explores what I've already talked about, about the potential contradiction between rights and results, between transformational development, which we see as a development which is a process of changes in power relations, and, and, and question how can de development agencies support such processes of changes in power relations, whether it be in gender, in equality, uh, income inequality, whatever, which actually sustains poverty in the world. And the transactional processes which are concerned with delivering certain tangible outcomes, bed nets, water taps, um, so many children at school, looking at how, counting how many children are at school, but not necessarily looking at the quality of the education and education as a process of empowerment. Um, and lastly, um, many of the chapters debate the issues of learning and accountability and how the results agenda tends to focus on a certain kind of accountability and accountability back up to the original donor and, and in that effort to be accountable people are no longer learning about how to actually be more effective development organisations and more effective development practitioners. And we ask, does there have to be that choice between learning and accountability? Can't, can't we do both? Okay, my last slide. Why? Several people have already commented to us that we have a strange subtitle, Playing the Game to Change the Rules. Who's playing the game? Well, the people playing the game are, we hope, the readers of the book. People who got caught up in the results agenda from one perspective or the other and who are worried that they can see some of the potentials, the benefits of, of results, the agenda, but they also see lots of problems with it. Um, and we're arguing that unless, if we're going to continue to have an international development system, taking that as given, then how do we as individuals and as organisations go along with that, but try and change the rules of it while we're actually part of it. Uh, and both at the conference and then from what came out of the chapters to the book, we came up with a number of strategies which we are recommending, let's go and put the strategies that we're recommending uh, for the reader uh, to consider. The most significant of these is actually what we've been calling personal agency. Uh, empower yourself. It's very interesting how, particularly for civil servants, for officials, for bureaucrats, uh, we tend to, oh, it's no good, I can't do anything, I just have to comply. Uh, or we become cynical. Uh, you don't like it, but you become cynical. But developing Feeling the power within, as a feminist would say, and saying, yes, I can do something about this, let's see what I can do, is amazing. And we have a number of case studies that show just people using their own personal agency can actually help change the system. You can push back. It's amazing the number of people who haven't thought about that and found that they can. However, as you'll find in Janet's chapter, Resistance of that kind doesn't always work either. So it's personal agency by itself is not enough. Political analysis 
understanding the context in which we are working, both in our own organisation and in the wider system. And that political analysis enables to seize political opportunities. For example, in the United Kingdom now, our independent commission for aid impact, um, which kind of started life as a number of bean counters, has actually become a really interesting organisation and published a report two months ago, which could have been this book, right? Which immediately strengthens the, the possibilities, the political opportunity um, for a lot of other people to say, look, independent, the Parliament's Independent Commission for Aid Impact is saying we have to think about qualitative approaches, not everything that counts is what is, is valuable, and so on and so forth. And we have to have projects which last a much longer period of time, and so on and so forth. Um, work with what is positive about the results agenda. Think about what is positive, and actually see what you can do with it. So think positively, not just negatively all the time. And this is an interesting conclusion of two or three years of work. We found from the conference that facilitating frontline staff to speak for themselves, one of the operations of power is that power tends to, in a bureaucracy, it tends to, people at the top of the, of the hierarchical chain are very distant from people at the bottom. And power keeps them separate. So if you bring a field worker to meet a minister, the minister is sometimes really surprised. Oh, is that what's going on? Why didn't anybody tell me? Right? Uh, uh, and this is a really effective strategy to actually bring people face to face. Um, and the last two was actually what we were doing in the Big Push Forward, which is creating spaces for learning and influence. This is a space for learning and influence. Um, and when the time is right, collective action. Uh, and collective action, not just within your own organisation, but importantly between organisations and between individuals among organisations. So, to wrap up, I of course recommend the book. I hope you'll enjoy it. There's some fascinating examples in there. And I'm going to hand over to Cathy. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to um, reiterate Rosalind's thanks for coming. It's lovely to be here in Stockholm. Um, I'm going to talk about the, my chapter, which is called The Politics and Practice of Value for Money. Um, and I'll just go through what I'm going to cover. First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the chapter aims and the current relevance. And I'll just elaborate on that now. I was very much a player in my chapter, as Rosalind just said, trying to change the rules of the game. Um, Value for Money was announced in 2010 in the UK as a new emphasis for development aid. And I started to engage with the agenda and was part of a process that involved a lot of other people trying to make sense of it and deciding how could we interpret this agenda in ways that supported transformational development rather than in ways that might actually reduce the space and just focus on results that could be counted and measured and valued monetarily. So it's very much a personal reflection and the aim is to try and inspire and encourage other practitioners to similarly not feel, get cynical as Rosalind was saying, or feel trapped if they are confronted with a new um, results type agenda and look for spaces and ways in which they can use it to support transformational change. So I sort of thought when I came here is a chapter that we started to write in 2013 still relevant today and certainly within the UK context there is still a lot of pressure to demonstrate value for money in development work and it still has a lot of relevance because although there have been some very encouraging examples and ways that we've used value for money positively there have also been difficulties with it <coughs> so really this ch my chapter is my story it's biased it's partial it's my opinion and it really sort of traces through a chronology of what happened after the initial political push 
from the Minister for International Development um, and how people in DFID, which is the main development agency, NGOs and what have you, tried to respond to something which was initially very ambiguous. What, you know, what were we meant to do? How could we demonstrate value for money? And then to talk a little bit about the effects in 2013 when we had the conference that Rosalind talked about, what were people actually experiencing? What have we learned by then? How was value for money playing out? Um, and because there were mixed effects, I want to go and talk on a little bit about some of the tactics that I'm suggesting for those confronted by value for money that you can use to increase the political space or opportunities to use a focus on value for money positively to encourage more transformational change. And then we'll just make some few conclusions on what needs to change. So the sort of the bomb was dropped, or there was a speech that Andrew Mitchell, who was then the Minister for Development, although we call um, in the UK an International Development Secretary at the time, made a public commitment that it was going to be a top priority for him to secure maximum value for money in aid through greater transparency, rigorous independent evaluation and an unremitting focus on results. And at the time, the development, those working in development agencies immediately turned around and said, well, what does that mean? How do we demonstrate value for money? What are we meant to do? And there was as much confusion within DFID as there was in recipient agencies who were receiving money. Um, and initially, the first framework, I don't know whether you can see it, that DFID presented as a way of thinking about value for money, which may be very familiar to those of you who are economists and used to cost um, effectiveness analysis or cost benefit analysis, was to start using this three framework, thinking about the economy, the costs of inputs for development programs, and how they related to efficiency in terms of the relationship between the costs and the quantity of outputs or the rate of conversion to outputs that were achieved. The effectiveness, the cost effectiveness in terms of the relationship between the money that was spent and the final impact. As Rosalind said, I don't want to go too much into the methodology, but this was basically a framework that was presented by DFID, which was applied to quite a simple um, programme about vaccination and obviously you can imagine that it might work for a vaccination program because you can um, anticipate how vaccinating the population might impact um, on health and there are established health metrics in used by economists to actually value the change or the impact that makes on people's quality of life. However, if you are supporting a programme which is trying to improve governments in Mozambique or um, women's rights in the country, obviously that's a much more difficult results chain to draw up and indeed to try and value. So people were very worried and they were very confused. And I got an email from somebody that was working in an NGO They'd been told to commission an evaluation and the terms of reference they'd seen from DFID um, said that they had to speak to value for money. And as you can tell from the quote here, the person that wrote the email said it's very frustrating because we've only got six pages from quite a big complex governance programme to talk about results and then three to four pages on value for money with no guidance from DFID on what we're meant to do. They've told us that we've got to take the lead in deciding how to interpret this. And actually, you know, we've decided that we're not going to spend too much time untangling this or the evaluation. So in 2010, 2011, that was the sort of common things of we really don't know what to do. We've been asked to do something, but there's no guidelines. And when we had an initial first meeting of what was then called the pushback, there were lots of questions that were being asked by people who were really concerned about the agenda. You know, and some of those Rosalind's always referred to, you know, whose values would we use when we were talking about value for money? Do we assume that we're talking about what value does DFID get as an investment back? Or are we talking about the values of the citizens who are the supposed beneficiaries of development programmes? The three framework talked about efficiency, effectiveness and economy. What about equity? 
Would there possibly be a drive for in thinking about more efficiency and more effectiveness? Would equity get forgotten? Again, as Rosalind said, if you look at aid or development from a relational perspective and believe that the success and the results achieved are very dependent on the quality of relationships, how do you actually reflect that back in a value for money analysis, either when you're planning or whether you're evaluating a development program? Um, we were very concerned again, if you were really pushing for efficiency, what would that mean to the quality of relationships with recipient organisations in developing countries? Would it mean that the amounts of money that were available for their overheads, that they'd start to get squeezed on these as an efficiency measure, where we were all happy sort of flying around as consultants, paid at much higher fee rates? You know, how would this all work out? What would it do to the quality of relationships? And how could some of the non-financial costs that are often ignored in, in development, such as just taking it for granted that people will participate, and we know it's well established in the literature that women's participation is often more expensive because they have so many care responsibilities, how would that be factored into some of the development programmes that rely on their participation to achieve success? So these are the anxieties that were being discussed in 2010. Now, while a lot of people were talking about these things and talking about methodologies, in the chat talk about some very fundamental ideological assumptions that might have underpinned the way we were articulating the, these concerns. And I think there are, you could say on a very extreme continuum, some people may not have been terribly worried who are quite comfortable with the idea of, of aid being explained to the public or taxpayers as a kind of transactional approach. And I've found a picture here of, you know, some of the charities in the UK actually advertise, if you give us £10, we can save a life or reduce um, the incidence of a disease. And we were very concerned that a value for money approach might be used in this way to actually start to say to the public, development's very simple, just give us £10 and we can save a whole load of lives. And what in the chat tried to, to do is, is to is expand these, on these two different ways of thinking about development. One is this kind of very managerial, we can just achieve results if we spend more money, which is quite a linear way of looking at the relationship between money and change. And an approach which you're probably much more familiar with here, a much more political approach to transformational change. Because I think there are fundamentally differences in the way you think about value for money, who values what, what development cooperation really is. Is it an investment by donor governments or is it an entitlement of recipient populations? And that would very much affect the way you would engage with value for money. So, some of well, us academics were sort of sitting and thinking about these issues about ideology and what have you. Practitioners in NGOs and DFID were saying, come on guys, we've just got to do it. We have to respond. What do we do? And in the UK, it was very interesting that a group of NGOs or a group of individuals in NGOs who were very confident said, this is an ambiguous space. DFID doesn't know what they're doing. Let's grab the reins. Let us define what value for money means for NGOs. And they developed a framework and a set of questions for NGOs to think about in terms of value for money. There's quite a good paper out there at different times of programme cycles. Um, but this just gives an overview. They decided they didn't want NGOs to have to try and do econometric analysis because they knew that the capacity to do so was very weak. So they built a triangle which kind of tries to meld the idea that there's a management side to Get, achieving value for money, um, and but a lot of it is about the management approach as you take during planning and deciding um, what approach you're going to look at or what approach you're going to use for a development program. They were very keen to start comparing instead of just assuming we've always tried to increase access to water in this way, we should maybe look at other approaches and consider which one might offer the best value for money. But there, there would be an element of trying to measure and demonstrate either through comparing their own the value they were achieving as organizations improvements over time or by trying to do comparisons across organizations although that's proved extremely difficult in practice for a whole set of reasons that i won't go into so we have this this confusion the ngos decide right we're going to try and, and drive the agenda and decide how value for money is going to be um, applied in practice 
and they worked very closely with um, their peers in DFID who were very broadly supportive of the NGOs trying to grab the agenda. And when we had a meeting in April 2013 to see how people were experiencing value for money, as Rosalind said, we got very mixed results. So in some organisations, people were finding it very empowering. They said this is long overdue, we've never talked about money before, it's been very untransparent how financial decision making has been made. This is a great opportunity to actually talk about and debate why we're spending money in certain ways, what do we value. Some were using methodologies like the social return on investment methodology, which is quite participatory, and we're finding it very useful to actually go out to poor people living in communities and say, what value are you getting from this programme? And actually finding that they may have very different values to those that were in the results frameworks that they were using back in their agencies. So there were some interesting experiences there. And then some smaller agencies were saying, this is great. Because when we start comparing our costs against UN agencies or the World Bank, we can actually show that we're much more efficient and similarly effective. So I did an, an evaluation for the Open Budget Initiative, which produces some similar reports to the World Bank and the IMF. But because they actually make them publicly available, they're more of a public good, and you can actually cost the amount of time they put into them, it's quite easy to make a persuasive argument that they actually are delivering pretty good value for money. Um, there was lots of new alliances between staff in DFID and NGOs, so a bunch of ex-NGO staff that worked in DFID had decided that there was a group of programmes with very hard to measure results or outcomes like women's empowerment and that they needed to find strategies to say how are we going to deal with this and let's tell our senior management we can't do value for money or cost benefit analysis, let's get together and make this argument. But unfortunately, there have been quite a lot of disempowering effects. Because value for money is a very ambiguous idea, everybody likes it, but it's quite difficult to operationalise, there has been a tendency to focus on economy and efficiency because effectiveness was so difficult to measure. So some of the clients I was working with as consultants were finding it very difficult when they were trying to commission work. I had one, um, consult, uh, one programme who was trying to commission an evaluation and when they received a bunch of tenders, they wanted to go for a more expensive tender because they knew that the cheapest tender, the people couldn't, they didn't have the capacity to do the work. But somebody in different procurement agencies said, no, you have to go for the cheapest offer. So they ended up with a, a having commissioned somebody that actually couldn't do the work. And then they had to capacitate them and spend more money on actually enabling them to develop the capacity to do it, which made them more expensive. Um, so those, and I think IPI, as Rosalind said, has been very useful. They've also looked at some of DFID's um, application of value for money and said the focus on efficiency has been much too strong. Also, economic measurements were far too narrow for some programmes and there were some interesting pushbacks. Um, that's just a cartoon of that illustrates that point. I don't know whether you can read the... The, um, it's a Dilbert cartoon that we use a lot in England to take, there's a lot of results-based um, humour, but it's um, somebody taking a cost estimate to a manager and them saying they can't make up because they don't even, they don't, can't estimate the costs because they haven't got enough information on the requirements. And when they're told to make it up, they're said, um, can you see it? Can you read it? Yeah. yeah, okay. So you get the general idea. But that's how a lot of people were feeling, that they were being asked to give these you know, ridiculous numbers, that there wasn't much um, meaning to them. So there was this mixture of uh, empowering and disempowering effects on the value for money agenda, but we were finding that people were responding to it in really interesting ways. So in the chapter I talk about a number of um, initiatives that people were taking to try and increase the transformational potential, um, and some of that was by some very savvy people who realised you can't just use this concept very broadly. Value for money is shaped by your values. So within an organisation you have to develop a statement saying what your value for money position is. And Christian Aid is an organisation that I use a lot in my writing or consultancy as an example because they said as an organisation we are interested in equity, sustainability and effectiveness. 
Efficiency and economy, okay, they're important, but they're secondary considerations. And as an organisation, because we value partnerships, we are putting a lot of emphasis on the knowledge and the understanding of people who are working on the ground in developing countries rather than managers sitting back home in the UK. So they've developed a nice document. I don't know the extent to which they actually implemented it, but it lays out very clearly saying, as an organisation that really wants to support transformational change, this is what value for money means for us and this is how we're going to implement it. Um, a lot of organisations looked at whose values tried to problematise and say we're actually interested in the values of citizens and not necessarily just the values of people back home. Um, there have been efforts to incorporate thinking from complexity science, which is basically making the argument, yes, we can do value for money analysis on a vaccination programme like the results chain I showed you, but for more complicated programmes where it's very difficult to anticipate change, Trying to predict value for money is very difficult and actually the best value you get is by learning, developing good learning approaches, good relationships and changing your approaches as context changes. There have been a lot of efforts to incorporate equity um, and some, some organisations that said we're going to shield our partners who are going to really struggle with this agenda and we will buffer them in the squeeze middle that Rosalind was talking about we will try and do the value for money analysis and not worry about, or not make our partners worry about doing that. Um, anyway, I won't go. But there was a whole set of organisations and individuals who were trying to use their personal agency to challenge the agenda and engage with it constructively, but in their reports back to DFID was kind of saying, this is how we are interpreting it, and this is why. So what needs to change, or what needs to stay the same? I think the experience from England so far shows that value for money is an important principle and potentially is very useful for stimulating debate. I think it's definitely very confusing and hard to apply and thus creates huge dilemmas for those who want to support transform development, transformational development. And the argument about what needs to change really just talks to the points that Rosalind's already made. And I think it's really power awareness and understanding our own role in reproducing these practices. As you can see from the UK example, it wasn't sort of different saying, here's a value for money framework, this is how it must be done. What has actually happened has been a result of people either engaging with it, resisting it, um, and the actual practice is very much shaped by individuals and groups of people working together. So I think the key message from the chapter is, is not to sort of feel that there's no hope or feel that it's hegemonic if value for money is appears to be being used in a way that may be more transactional development than transformational development and to use agency to try and change the rules of the game, collective action and to also take this great opportunity to actually talk to each other about what our assumptions are about value and its relationship to the money that's invested in the name of international development. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy and uh, Rosalind. Um, uh, yeah. So um, I'm going to present my chapter uh, in the book. Uh, it's about uh, a very short version about my PhD, uh, in which I write about the results agenda in Swedish uh, development aid. I'm doing a historical comparison where I'm uh, uh, looking at four initiatives within SIDA. Uh, on how uh, staff have reacted upon uh, results uh, management initiatives. Um, and the idea for this PhD, as Joran said, I, I have my background from uh, SIDA uh, and uh, I was working there from 1998 until 2011. Uh, and during that time, uh, I really saw the organization change from a very policy uh, organization towards a very management oriented organization uh, in which results was a very key topic and control uh, control agenda and, and so and uh, yeah I wanted to search back more into history and look at what has uh, been written about this in uh, other areas um, so the topic of my uh, is the results area in Swedish development cooperation cycles of failure or reform success? And uh, uh, the title is uh, from uh, that the 
you can see that there have has been some waves in the terms of when results come in as a very hot topic uh, in development data, and then it kind of fails and then fails or goes out, and something else comes in. And uh, uh, I was uh, I, when I started off in 2012, uh, it was a very hot topic in the government at, the, at that time uh, and I was in this chapter then discussing a bit that okay is this really since it is really has this political support or political push this time in history is there a larger chance for this to actually succeed or to, to or will it be this yeah a failure or uh, if you whatever you call a failure or, or a success so that's uh, the topic and the way uh, I look at um, the theoretical, theoretical base, base for politics of results is that, uh, um, well, there is a program and then uh, that program is kind of implemented into a technology. And the program is very much, uh, um, well, it can be a political idea and someone like, we want to see results. We don't know where development aid money is going to. So we want to know that these are the results of our taxpayers' money. Uh, come from the media, politicians, or the, the, some, somewhere this push that we want to see results. Um, and within the agency, it's uh, typically or at CEDA, and this is in, uh, in um, research literature as, as well, that often these types of uh, political ideas or pushes are transformed into some technologies like here it's this result chain or the logical framework uh, which is uh, okay we we will look at it in uh, in this way inputs outputs outcomes and effects and then we put in the numbers in this box and uh, then we know what results we have um, so um, yeah and this is kind of the picture of what, what results then could be in the input of a CEDA watering, uh, providing funding for it and uh, harvesting the and see then happy people. This is a picture from a CEDA handbook on results management in the, in the 70s. Um, so the idea is very much this when I'm looking at these concepts of program technology and practice, the idea is then that okay this Someone pushes for results, and then we have this technology, this box, we put in the numbers, and then practice goes well, and we produce results. And it goes, uh, results of transform transformational development, that it goes like uh, upwards, and then there is a positive change happening. Uh, however, we're in uh, research in management and uh, accounting, uh, uh, it's a previous research really said that okay, it goes in, in ways that it doesn't always go up the curve like that. That it doesn't happen that in that way. And the, uh, and the, there's lots of well explanations that people put lots of hope into the technologies uh, in the beginning of a reform and they really want to see that. But then when the technology is actually implemented in the organization, this input output box. It is very complex often to measure, to aggregate the numbers, to, uh, to, to do it and know what is actually a result. Uh, and uh, uh, then the technologies encounter a resistance in the organizations and then they kind of fail and fade away and people start to talk about other things and but then after 10 years or 15 years or something they come back again. Um, so in my research, I kind of identified then these four initiatives. It's from 1971, 1981, 1998, and 2012. And uh, uh, the question mark I have in my PhD is then that okay, is, it, is this so? That is it? A, is it a wave? Or can we see these as peaks? Uh, um, these are these four initiatives that I'm looking at are kind of similar where there has been. A larger push, and when they have, Zina has tried to uh, uh, find results in an aggregated format by introducing a technology like the logical framework. It's uh, kind of similar to some differences in this, but it's uh, a, a harder push during these years. So then I'm comparing these initiatives and looking at like, what was different 
in the 70s and what's kind of similarities and, um, and uh, in, in the 70s, 80s, 90s and today. Um, so uh, yeah, this, uh, the typical difficulties that I find out in these uh, initiatives is uh, uh, yeah, with the definition, okay, what is uh, the result? Uh, how should we measure it? How should we aggregate it? Uh, attribute, is it, uh, how do we actually attribute it into the Swedish funding and how do we, how do we know it's our funding contributing to that? And which indicators are we going to have? Resistance from staff, um, I will have some citations on this, I'll just put there. Um, and uh, uh, the purpose of the, the uh, results, of who are we actually producing this results information for? Is it for the Swedish parliament, is it for the taxpayers, is it for the recipients? Um, you can see that the, the results information is, uh, from these initiatives, it's actually uh, never used for the purpose that was put up uh, initially in the initiative, that we're going to produce this for annual reports for CEDA or for the um, aggregated form. It's never used for that purpose because it uh, always ends up with so many difficulties that you couldn't actually, can you actually trust this information or can you actually do something about it? It's uh, considered too low quality, it's considered uh, to not be sufficient in order to actually be used in the way it was uh, in, in, in intended to be used. Um, and there's also a very low use of the technology as such uh, among CEDA staff. It's uh, like 25% of CEDA staff actually kind of following the decision that, okay, we should use this in all our contributions, but uh, it's very, very low use of that the staff probably don't uh, they consider that it's actually useful for them to, to be used in project management. Uh, and then, the, yeah, the difficulties with that, the costs of it. Is it actually considered, uh, it costs so much to produce this information that is it, is it actually uh, efficient or should be like, is there a better way of using, the, the, to use your time for like dialogue with the partners? Um, so here, just some citations from people uh, so, um, well, to just show these typical difficulties that uh, it's a Sika staff in the 1970s or in an interview today who said that there were always difficulties to prove the relation between Swedish funding and its impacts. Uh, and this is also something I find in my research is that uh, the difficulties are really the very, very same. It's kind of like you could have said that, uh, looking at Lena, but you could there could be someone saying this citation today or in the 80s, and there's always like the same type of difficulties considered. Uh, so, and um, yeah, some see the staff today who say that yeah, we don't understand what it is, what is meant by results and the indicators that you want in order to measure measure results. Um, and the other that the requirements are becoming so extensive that time is poorly allowed to do in wise assessments. The time aspect is quite uh, often that we put so much time into these uh, systems and technologies that we don't have time to do uh, other, other stuff that we are doing as development managers. Um, so, uh, in the chapter I have been looking more about this, the latest reform, when, it was, when there was really a hard push for results uh, during the, the last uh, uh, government. And, uh, um, well, the Minister of Aid was pushing for this uh, results and agenda very hard. Uh, it, they became conflicts uh, or some uh, CEDA staff were resisting and officially in letters also arguing that it was a very difficult agenda to push for and specifically these measurements and measurement aspects. Uh, and uh, just yeah, one of the citations uh, from the minister from 2011 that I will not give up. We must work more with results oriented in aid. We must be able to tell the parliament and the voters of all positive things that are done in a comprehensive way. We must also have a totally different documentation and systematization in how we think of results in aid. 
So there was a very hard push to tell Swedish taxpayers specifically about, um, uh, about what is happening. Uh, and what this then took off at CEDA, uh, it was much more, if I compare to the earlier initiatives, uh, the, there was more of a, since there was this very political will of it, it became more uh, seen the internal as also that there were some positive aspects looked upon this. And CEDA directed um, uh, a citation that I'm absolutely convinced that both the new grant management procedure and the standardized indicators and monitoring results will give stability in the working processes. And the working atmosphere for the individual program officer will become, become much clearer. So there was an idea that this would really give uh, yeah, stability into, into the um, procedures. Um, and there was a very hard effect also compare with the, the earlier initiatives. There has been a very hard push at CEDA to try to change the results culture, kind of a culture within the organization to look at. Uh, uh, look how to work with results. This is a picture which was written in a communication strategy about how to make CEDA staff more attentive to um, work with, uh, the, the, with results within CEDA, uh, where it's kind of yeah, denial uh, from the beginning and then attendance that we will be the best in the world to, to do uh, the results agenda. Um, okay, so if I compare then uh, the, uh, the earlier reforms and then the current reform, or at least uh, when I wrote this chapter for a year ago, I think the things have really changed for, for today, but at least uh, for a year ago this was my analysis, that uh, uh, if you compare uh, that, okay, will this new reform have uh, better success or, or if will there be more possibilities to succeed? Uh, that earlier results was really a technical sub-theme. Uh, it was uh, something, yeah, like gender or education or something, where, and then, okay, and then we need results in order to do that. But during this last uh, agenda, or la last reform, results was really the political agenda. That was the political agenda pushed for. Uh, and uh, <laughs> maybe, like gender and the other, Topics were like uh, un under it, but it was we need results was the agenda. Uh, earlier, there was mo much more focus on results were for the recipients. That's why we need to produce them. It's for the recipients' use, and we need to support them in that. Uh, in today's agenda, it has been much more for communication purposes and for the Swedish uh, taxpayers. Um, CEDA has uh, definitely uh, changed uh, the earlier and kind of more of a policy organization that do the right things and today it's more a management organization that do things right. Uh, earlier there was uh, it was a question for few staff at Sweden CEDA, like a few are uh, unique to someone who worked with this. Uh, now it really has really been a question for the whole organization and then there is also more knowledge on how to how to do it, how, how to measure. So uh, earlier there has been very weak support, and that's also in the board of directors, and it's been kind of negative or critical in the board of directors for the results in that. And today uh, it has been a very really the top priority. Um, and there has today been very high pressure internationally to do the agenda. So uh, well. Is it a cycle of failure or a reform success then? I think you can't um, say. Uh, uh, it's, uh, this is a comment from uh, CEDA staff uh, uh, today, that our weakest link is where the development is produced in the recipient countries. The government's new students have probably not had any impact on the ground, but maybe it will come later. So it's kind of, uh, well, has it, it has, <laughs> this is, Kind of like, is it, has it been a show-off again, like for CEDA internally, and what has actually happened? Is it leading to, to results? It's a citation uh, saying. Uh, there are also 
staff that are saying that okay, this is success, that it is really uh, we are that uh, like this uh, director who is saying that it has increased the competence of CEDA uh, and uh, attitudes have changed towards the agenda. So there are both uh, well, well, positive and some uh, negative comments about it. Uh, my preliminary findings, I'm looking at the, I know that we, we should have, have much more time for comments, uh, but uh, it's really, if you look at the, the curves, that is there like a curve like that? Uh, I would say that it's, uh, the, there are some, the, the, you can't see that there are these uh, curves, uh, it's uh, very much that the, the program or the idea of results has been pushed a little bit more on some occasions during history, uh, but uh, uh, it's also a stable element. It's pushed for all the time, so it's nothing that has... Uh, it has been pushed for since the 70s until now. However, the technology, or when you do something about it, uh, sometimes it's uh, like CEDA does something about it because there is political drive, but some of the initiatives have really been driven from inside or for some other. It's not been because of a political drive. Uh, and if I want to make one point uh, out of here is that the practice or how people react to that, uh, that, uh, that has not been considered. Uh, and kind of like how this resistance towards these technologies, that people are much more reacting not towards the political push for the idea of results, but much more if it's too administratively burdensome for them. To, to work with this technology, then they are assisting, then they are feeling uh, like this is not good for my projects or something, and that is really something to, to be looked upon and considered if uh, these types of reforms are uh, implemented. How do staff actually react uh, upon these reforms? Okay, thank you. I know. Perhaps I can start. The first question, you can think about the question. Uh, I would like to ask a question. Uh, these strategies that you talk about in the, uh, in the book, uh, both in your chapter, Kathy, and at the end of the book, um, uh, I think they're very, they are very interesting and it sounds very good. <laughs> you you, you, you um, propose, I think it's seven strategies, to improve the use of results and evidence methods. For example, you need to develop political smartness, uh, personal agency for, uh, to push back. Uh, you need to identify and work with what is positive about the results and evidence agenda. Facilitate frontline staff to speak for themselves and so on. Um, and my question is, uh, who who should do this? Um, who is responsible for making use of these strategies? Uh, is, it the, um, the, is it the politicians? Or is it the head, head of units or head of agencies? Or is it the, the front-line the front staff themselves? Uh, and, and connected to that question, uh, why, is it, why, why are these strategies not in use already? Because to me, there sounds like obvious, some of them at least, um, that you should speak out when there is trouble, of course. So I would really like you to sort of elaborate on that a bit. Should we take a few more? Sure. Yes, we can do that. We can do that. Yes, please state your name and your, your organization for posing the question. Okay, my name is Leonard Wolkimov. I'm from Gothenburg University, but I have some past in, 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 in uh, both evaluation and administrative work at CETA. Uh, I think one very interesting point that uh, uh, was pointed out in the last presentation was that uh, recipient orientation press was slightly stronger, at least in the 70s. Now, when you do your presentation, and I am now perhaps too critical because I haven't used, read you what you, the book. But when you do your presentation, you talk about the donors, the donor representatives, the people in the north. And, when you, and where is the strategy for, because I see development cooperation, and we all see development cooperation, assisting in other countries or other people's development. 
it's a help to self help. So the ones who should be in front line when it comes to strategy of change should be the people who are actually implementing the, the change with the help of from the donors. But I think what you talk about is, I mean, I agree, I mean, agency is very good, but I would probably talk more about agency in the developing countries. Thank you. Yes, somebody there. We can summon some more questions. Please. Hi, my, my name is Helena Bjorn from International Idea, so primarily uh, interested in democracy systems. I have two questions. Uh, in your conference, did you ever talk about taxpayers, the infamous taxpayers, who are the ultimate end users of all these results that are produced? Do they really want those results presented in that manner of bed nets, saving X number? Or are they maybe more interested in the, like in your book you talk about the children presenting their drawings? Wouldn't that fly? Has anybody investigated that? Second question, uh, did you see any difference, differences across the sectors? Yeah, I think in your presentation you talked about the women's empowerment tend to be more difficult than other sections, sectors of development cooperation, but if you could elaborate a bit about differences sort of within development cooperation rather than just lumping it into one big act. Thank you. Okay, I think we can start. Um, who are the strategies for? And it actually speaks a little bit also to, um, sorry, it was uh, Lennart's question. Also, where where are the, where are the citizens of developing countries that the international aid system exists for? The, the book is focused on the issues relating to uh, with the results and evidence agenda as it has been defined, framed, used by the international development system and its agencies. The people in those agencies, many of them are indeed citizens of developing countries. Uh, staff of many agencies are not all from the north. And indeed, I gave a workshop for Action Aid in Nigeria in 2012, where they saw themselves very much as a squeezed middle. They were having to implement stuff that was coming down to them from the global level, not from London, but globally, who themselves were having to put into practice stuff that was coming from their ultimate donors. So the strategies are actually for people in those situations, whether they're in the north or the south, they're for people like Ola, I already mentioned in our book, who, who, who runs a civil society organization in Palestine, which is a recipient of donor money, and she's feeling constrained about what she actually wants to do with the disabled people's organizations and the women's group that her organization supports is being constrained by the demands being made upon their organization in exchange for getting money. So that's, that's, the, that's the readership. And how can you actually, if you're trying to support and enhance processes of societal transformation for the rights of people with disability, in Ola's case, what are the strategies you can use in order to get the money out of the international aid system and use it in support of the rights-based approaches that you are trying to, to enhance? Is that kind of clear enough? So, so that is, I hope that answers Lennart's question as well. Um, Oh, the second one, that's the last one. Helena's question. Famous taxpayer? Where's the famous taxpayer? Do they want these? <laughs> um, we had discussed that quite a lot, the interest of the taxpayers. Um, there's not a huge amount of research um, to, that, that really looks at what they expect, so I think the picture's pretty unclear. Um, I think at the moment the way that aid is being framed in the UK discourse is very much shifted and it's a lot about the domestic interests back home, that it's both in our security interests or our business interests and that's quite a shift in discourse or it's become very much more obvious obviously over the ten, last 10 years. Whether anybody actually reads the accounts which use those aggregated figures that actually are the ones that cause all the pain 
I don't know, I think that would be really interesting to know actually who the readership is and whether anybody does engage with it, and also Parliament, but I'm, I'm not really sure about that. Um, I just wanted to sort of this question a bit. I think I do use an example. I think value for money is very useful for getting empowered organisations in recipient countries to start asking questions. And I think my chapter has a couple of examples um, around, you know, why are you spending money in that way or arguing for their relative cost efficiency versus international consultants and that kind of thing. And I've certainly encountered that. So I think, and I did mention that there is a strategy that one would hope partners would use and engage. I think um, the social return on investment was an, an attempt to sort of use more participatory approaches to look at value, but I think in many instances it ends up being used in quite an extractive way. So it was just to show we've tried a value for money methodology to engage um, people in discussions, but the extent to which that actually influenced what happened next, um, I think there are, there are a lot of questions around that. And I'd also like to say that I recently was involved two weeks ago in an evaluation process where we've been told by the executing agency that the results-based technologies or processes were incredibly demanding on the local partners in the country. And I went around and interviewed 11 of them and I could not get one of them to complain at all, even though I was really leading questions saying, don't you find this burdensome? I think it's mad. And people go, no, it's absolutely fine. So I think the power, the power relations of actually getting the people to engage are, are huge. And I think Rosalind also talks about, I mean, there is a problem. This book is set in a very normative position. And we have people at the conference saying, you know, for a lot of development people in recipient countries, it's a job. Um, and they don't have a problem with it. Or they think it's very useful for actually holding their governments to account. So we had one participant from Nigeria who said, I think this is great, you know, we're talking about transparency, accountability, this is exactly what we need our government to take up. So you're right, it's a really it's an important issue that we haven't explored in this in, and that wasn't necessarily our prime aim. But I think the point you make are extremely valid um, and present a challenge going forward. Okay. <coughs> we are, now we are lagging <laughs> in time, but we have room for two, three more questions. And um, then we have to stop for the coffee break. Okay? Uh, thanks. I'm uh, Simara Johnson from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. And I'm not sure you ca how you're going to answer this. I was asking students. But I was thinking about uh, playing the game to change the rules. And I was thinking playing the game would mean, if you think about the last presentation, being at, at the top of the you know, new technologies of bureaucracy and administration and so on. And can you really do that? When, and can you really change the game then? Because you have you spend all your time playing the game. And from what I think of some of the people I know of Siva who actually have been able to do things differently, they've circumvented the game altogether in different ways. So do you really think that is what you need to do? Okay. We will sum some of the well, questions now. Uh, my name is Prudence Woodford Berger, um, pensioners without borders nowadays. But I've done a number of things um, uh, before that, including working uh, as a researcher and at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. I just have one speculative question. Um, I'm wondering what you three think about the fact that the results agenda on a larger global scale is going to be enhanced by the 17 new sustainable development goals, the 170 objectives. So I'm just, yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? Thank you. Okay, and one final question. I think it was there. There will be room for questions later also, you can, so you can hold on to your questions if you have them. Thank you, my name is Lauren Mazancueva, I work at CEDA. I think there is quite a lot of recognition that development is very complex, it's messy, it's political, and it's very different, difficult to know what will happen in the future. Um, but, and I think that uh, the results agenda, um, or, or rather, just to be short, is there a way for the results agenda, or have you seen any tendencies that the results agenda could push for more demand for results and less focus on input planning, detailed uh, log frames that try to foresee 
or or is that still to to be count to to be to be seen? Thanks. So can I ask you to answer something? Sure I, I wasn't sure if I actually got the last question, but I, I was uh, just, I, I think, uh, just on, the, on your question about playing the games in view uh, theoretically about it, but I think uh, what my research really shows is that uh, people have not played the game uh, within CEDA. I mean, the, the, historically, they, they did not play the game because they didn't follow the rule to do this. Uh, so, like, an average 25% of the staff were actually, like, Fill in a lot of frames and so uh, for projects, and uh, uh, and then the initiatives kind of fail. So I think people and people have always and staff and see have always like trusted relations more and their own intuition on okay this is really what makes development work, and they. They, they don't care about those because they, it doesn't tell them. And I think the question about the uh, about what type of information you actually I, I read a really interesting article about how people actually if they and I know that there is maybe no research about how taxpayers what type of information they actually want, but maybe some people want the boxes and the numbers and really it really tells them something and. And for other people, they want stories and they want pictures and they want something they can really understand that this is the reality. So I think that uh, there is probably some need for producing different types of results information, but uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, but <laughs> different. But then, but then maybe like looking at the, what are the costs of actually producing this and what are the yeah what is the best way of producing and what do people really want? And so, yeah. So. I'm not quite sure. I just would like the point from the uh, the colleague from CEDA. Um, do you want to ask again? Mm -hmm. I don't know if we have time. Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. We, yes, we have to talk about it. Well, the social development goals. Yeah. Uh, I can just imagine the MDGs were bad enough as a number of development agencies. You know. Kind of the, the, the minute the many development goals were never meant to be targets with indicators. They were meant to be political aspirations to create an enthusiasm for global change. And the heavy arm of bureaucracy um, and uh, the technologies and everything, you know, transformed them into something that they weren't meant to be. The social development, the sustainable development goals seem to be. MDGs ten times worse in that respect, um, and perhaps I'm very cynical about this. Perhaps perhaps the worst aspect of the international aid industry, which is a lot of people spend a lot of time and money going to conferences to talk about it, is very little evidence that the Millennium Development Goals actually what have been achieved. There's very little evidence it's a direct result of the goals existing. So let's. Let's live in hope. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Okay, I think we should give the authors an applause. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, we have uh, 18 copies of the book uh, for sold, so, and uh, uh, Helena will be selling it. It's 130 crowns. And uh, cash or fish, uh, or then you can, I, or then you can order the book here. Uh, you have the postcards here, so you can order them on the online. And you find coffee in the back of the, of the room. And we will start ten to ten to three of you.